pioneer in frontal lobe research itself. So this part of the brain has for a long time been ignored very strongly, and she did mainly animal studies with monkeys and cell recordings to uh, investigate structure and function. So she really pioneered that, and we actually can see um, the number of publications on prefrontal areas before she started research and a couple of years after she started research really rose uh, quite steeply. So she initiated a new line of research here. Uh, she's founder of the quite well regarded journal Cerebral Cortex and uh, was at the time she started work one of the very few women who really got far in academia. So she got a lot of prizes for the successful women in career and things like that as well. <clears throat> and she had basically a different concept of how everything is organized. And she actually, uh, in one of her papers, um, used the Bentley model of the working memory where you say you have a central executive and you have your visual spatial sketch pad and you have your auditory loop and she says it is not distinct like that. What you basically have is one common thing subdivided with respect to content, spatial, feature, linguistic and within each uh, domain or area you do maintenance and manipulation together. So we don't have a separate. So let's have a look how she came to that conclusion. And what she did, or what she worked with a lot, is a so-called delayed response task. And schematic illustration is here. You, as I said, she worked with uh, monkeys. So you show a monkey like a foot pellet is below that uh, thing here, or so that bowl. Then you close the screen, you cover the bowls, you open the screen, and you look, check where is the monkey looking. So did you remember in this delay period where to look, where the target is? And what she did is was measuring the activity of cells in the pre lateral prefrontal cortex during that delay period, because she said a memory representation must be active during that period. Here you may have encoding of where the stimulus is, here you may have activity due to movement and action and responding, but here it should be solely dedicated to keeping, to maintaining the memory content. So, there are different versions of this task, and this is the spatial task of that, so you have uh, different variants here, you have um, a fixation cross at the center, and you just give a cue, and then after a delay, the monkey have to, has to do a saccade to that location which has previously been cued. And this is an example of uh, a neuron, how it responds in the lateral prefrontal cortex. So this is fixation period, C is the cue period, so activity increases, and then D, this long period, is a delay period. And see, you see increased activity here, then you have the response, and activity goes down. So she would argue that is a typical neuron which encodes memory. You can do the same task, not in a spatial variant, but as an object variant. So this is delayed matching to sample with objects, uh, maybe done in different variants. For instance, you show, you show one picture, and then after the delay, you show two pictures, one which has been seen before, one which hasn't been seen. And the monkey is trained to look to the one which he has seen before, for instance. So that he needs to ident uh, memorize the identity of the object. And again, you have an example of a neuron which encodes and memorizes this type of thing. And what she found is that the frequency of these different types of neurons differs among cortical areas. And she says in ventral areas, that means in the monkey brain, below, inferior to the principal sulcus, you mainly have object <coughs> and memorizing neurons, and in the dorsal areas, above the principal sulcus, you mainly have spatial areas. So she argued you have a distinction um, 
with respect to the content of the work, <coughs> the spatial or object. Okay. So, and therefore, she proposed that model. And she said, okay, dorsal, we have spatial. And in the dorsal attribute cortex, we do maintenance and manipulation of spatial content. And in the ventral areas, we have feature and linguistic. So these are uh, 46.8 is spatial processing. So areas 46 and 8. In the human brain, it would kind of skip area 9 here, but the monkey brain is organized slightly different. So come down. 45.12, this is anterior inferior frontal cortex. She would say it's feature, that means object memory. And then the more posterior, 44 and 47, is um, then she would call that linguistic. Uh, so in the monkeys, you have, of course, uh, different calls and everything, not speech like in humans, where this is then has become Broca's area but uh, still related to the university process. Okay. Um, at this point, I would like to mention something, and that's basically all I want to uh, mention with this respect. When we talk about the functional neuroanatomy, or the brain representation of executive functions, I really heavily focus on prefrontal areas. They don't do it alone. There are associated parietal areas as well. So when you do, for instance, um, and the, such a task in the MRI scanner, you will find what is called a frontal parietal network of brain areas. So um, the idea is that they work together, and there are some hypotheses that the frontal areas um, coordinate task processing by biasing or influencing or basic task processing in parietal areas. So, it is more strongly linked to prefrontal areas, but it's not the only areas. Okay. So these are, that's why I mentioned area 7 in the parietal cortex, the linked respective posterior brain areas with the feature TE is temporal, and 3940 is here, which is in humans, the Wernicke's area, which is a perception of speech. Um, in these tasks, is there comparatively more acti activity in the frontal lobe? Yes. yes. <clears throat> so, to summarize the content-based theory, it is proposing that the lateral prefrontal cortex is subdivided by content and not by process. And that you have maintenance and manipulation within the same area. And this nicely fits into the general structure of the visual system. Um, you probably know that there are two visual streams. Mm -hmm. The where stream or how to stream, which goes more parietal, and the what stream, which goes then ventral to the temporal lobe about the identity of objects. Mm -hmm. And she would argue, well, that nicely continues in the prefrontal cortex, that the more spatial information stays dorsal and the more object information stays ventral. And you can show in the um, human brain, actually it has been shown, that uh, that is uh, a reasonable assumption. For instance, you have strong connections by long association fibers in the white matter between anterior temporal areas and inferior frontal. So here you have object, but you have auditory areas that extending here as well, and they are linked pretty strong with these uh, speech-related areas, inferior areas, while you have projections going from superior parietal areas to more superior frontal areas, which makes sense when you really consider that you have frontal eye fields here, and superior parietal is, you have spatial maps of pure measurement. Okay, um, there are some problems with the content-based theory, and that is basically that the evidence is mainly coming from monkeys. And as we said before, um, the relationship is not quite clear between monkey anatomy and human anatomy. And for instance, the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex um, 
which is the broadcast area, is related to speech production in humans, which she would associate partly with uh, object processing with respect to broadcast area. And the evidence in humans, actually, is a bit pending. Sorry. So, um, what is it then? So, this person, Mark Desposito, from Berkeley in the US, uh, decided at some point in time, okay, maybe it's time to do a meta-analysis. Look at all the evidence which has been accumulated so far. And so, he looked at quite a few image, brain imaging studies, which used um, spatial and non-spatial material, and were able to differentiate between manipulation and maintenance. And then he just plotted that on such a schematic illustration. And here you see, unfortunately, most studies probably are uh, of non-spatial nature, but there's no real systematic pattern emerging. So the red dots are activities um, observed in fMRI studies related to spatial memory and blue to non-spatial object memory. So we did the same graph, but divided the studies by whether maintenance or manipulation was required, and a more clear pattern occurred in the way that maintenance-only studies are more often localized in ventral areas than in dorsal, left as well as right hemisphere, and the studies requiring more than pure maintenance were more often localized in superior or dorsal ventral cortices. So at the moment, it seems fair to say that at least in humans, the content-based theory seems the more accurate or the better descriptive way to describe. Okay, um, do you have any questions so far? Um. Uh, are these kind of studies the main um, criteria for executive functions? Or um, but is it just sort of the earlier? Um, no, um, it's not. I cover that actually in, in the first bit where you haven't been oh, here. Sorry. Okay. So, but I will come back to that as well. Okay. So these studies are not that strictly related to executive function. They are more about how the lateral prefrontal cortex is organized. Okay. And before uh, I made the point that the lateral prefrontal cortex is the essential anatomical area where executive functions are assumed to be localized. In okay. the so then it's a more general view on this area before we then look more specifically. Okay. Okay. So um, I want to make a very brief detour here on animal studies. And um, because as psychologists, we are actually in the position that we might get into such studies. So it's an opportunity in our career to, to go there and actually work with, for instance, monkeys or cats by ourselves and do cell recordings. So it can be done by psychologists. You don't need to be a medical doctor or something like that, or a physiologist or biologist. And um, while I did my study, um, I tried to have a look at that. So we had to do uh, several internships, so I tried to get one internship in a lab where they do single cell recordings just to decide for myself would that be an option or not. And so this detour is a little bit based on that experience and um, just to give you some background what to consider. And one thing for me it came out quite clearly are ethical considerations here. Because even if everything works in accordance with ethics, um, one cannot say else than it's not nice to the animals. So it is like that. Mm -hmm. So um, if you do ablation studies, you are actually um, <coughs> in strong cortical areas, or you at least do surgery, cooling down, cooling up, and do stuff like that. Uh, another thing, um, this has changed in the last years, but uh, what I at least haven't been aware of that usually, at least in the earlier times, the animal has to be killed after the study is finished. 
And that is because before high resolution fMRI and uh, appropriate electrode materials were, which are MI suitable or available, people never knew where exactly the uh, electrode has been localized. Because it's so thin, you just stick it in, then you record, and when you have your data, you kill the animal, and then you dissect to see where exactly did I place my electrode. So it's not like, um, well, it's such a thin electrode, you just, after recording, the animal lives on, maybe for another study or something. Today, that has changed because you have electrodes which are capable uh, and suitable for the MRI, and so you can go with them after the study with the animal into the MRI and have a high resolution scan to see what it is. So sometimes um, these animals can survive. Another example which I've seen in that lab is uh, they investigated quite heavily the visual cortex as well. And in studies of visual cortex, cats are often used because their visual cortex is quite similar to ours. And uh, there the animals are often just put uh, under full anesthesia and are just recorded so long until uh, their circulation cortex and they die. So they hope to test for one to three days or something until the animal dies by itself, so to say. So um, it's just, I don't want to put a label and say don't do that or something. It's just to keep in mind. It's not like uh, going to a petting zoo or something like that. Animals are kept in an animal house, which I found less nice than the typical zoo thing or something. So just um, to keep that in mind. Another thing um, are kind of practical considerations, and I wanted to attend a training session of a monkey, and um, he was uh, getting into the training chamber, and I found the whole thing for myself actually a bit disturbing because they had uh, been surgery, and so they got the electrodes implanted, and then they get kind of a cap on there. Uh, which is a fixed outlet for the electrodes, which is made in a way so that they can't hurt themselves and they can't rip off the cables or things like that. Mm -hmm. And then they get to the chamber and it is like this cap is really fixed and you have like a metal piece looking out of that and they just screw, fix by screw this metal piece so the monkey can't move a millimeter in his head because it's also restricted and then he sits in front of the computer and he had to do a task which is actually not that complicated to us humans. I can't remember, maybe it was such a delayed uh, res uh, response task, so just memorize, maybe it was an anti saccade task, so if something blinks right, look to the left or something. So mm -hmm. for a human, you would tell him once, do that, and he would do that. And for the monkey, the training works like that. They get into the chamber and uh, get a response button, and every time, they do the correct response, they get a drop of orange juice as you want. And so the monkey <coughs> was getting into this chamber for that task, and as soon as he was in, here, in there, for the complete time I have been in there, he was just hammering on that button constantly. And because he found out when sometimes he puts that, he gets uh, a drop of juice. And then I heard that this monkey was in daily training for half a year already. So, what we learn in a minute, a monkey may easily take a year of daily training. So when you read in studies what they all can do, they actually can do that. But it takes them a hell of time. So, just for practical consideration, it's much easier to work with humans because they are um, capable. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was just a bit of my perspective on the things. Uh, as I said, I don't want to impose any view here. It's just what we have to consider. Mm -hmm. Any questions regarding that? Okay. Then um, let's turn to the more clinical side of things. <clears throat> and um, you may not know the picture, but you may have heard of the name of this researcher. And this is Wilder Penfield, uh, a Canadian neurosurgeon. Um, his active view is quite a while ago. 
uh, already, and he is probably most famous for his discovery of the motor homologous on the primary motor cortex, how our body is represented. And he found that because he did really lots of surgeries uh, for uh, epilepsy patients. And at these times, often epilepsy was treated by uh, inducing lesions to the brain. So we just uh, had the idea that, I don't know, the, um, the um, focus where the epilepsy uh, arises from in the brain is temporal cortex, so you would do a lesion to the temporal cortex. Same materials applies to the uh, frontal cortex. So um, he did that. And um, he also did quite a bit of research on frontal lobe uh, lesions. And that is um, a particular difficult case for him because that's actually the brain of his sister. And his sister suffered from a very severe glial tumor which is very hard to surgically remove. So he did the surgery on his own sister, tried to remove that, so basically he did this damage to the brain. And however, because it's so hard to treat, there are tumors which just, you know, they spread with thin branches. You just can't remove them surgically. surgically. You don't get everything of the tumor. You may remove most of that, but it will just continue growing. And so, uh, even today, there are tumors which are nearly untreatable uh, because they are so spread out. So you may try it nowadays chemotherapy or something, but that, that is not successful when um, it's terminal. And um, so he performed the surgery. And together with uh, two other cases, he, uh, after her death, um, published that case as a clinical study of maximum uh, removals in frontal lobe. And so he was kind of a pioneer in frontal lobe function as well, so to say, in, in this respect. And to illustrate what happens if people have damage to the lateral prefrontal cortex. I would like to cite him, and although the quote nicely would fit, it's actually not about his sister. Some other patients, this quote is from two years earlier than my sister's case. So he wrote, she could remember the ingredients for dishes, but she could not organize her actions into a proper temporal sequence. Her behavior was haphazard. She might assemble all of the ingredients, but switch her preparation from one dish to the other, or mix up which item belonged together. No longer could she keep a given task to achieve a coherent goal. So this is a very typical description of a person with damage to the prefrontal cortex. And this type of uh, deficit has been called frontal lobe syndrome, or dysreflective syndrome. Okay. And before we turn to that um, and go a little more detail, I would say we do a break of like 10 minutes or something. Okay?